Welcome back to That Time When. Matt Miller with you in Studio 4. This is the podcast series where I take you through the archive here at Trackside. And today, I'm just going to get straight into it because this is That Time When. I interviewed Alec Peters. Man, this one didn't age well. G'day everyone and welcome to the Trek Zone Spotlight. Alec Peters spoke at length about his ambitious project Star Trek Axanar yesterday in a pre-recorded interview with me. Feeling the need to control the narrative, Alec took exception to several of my questions and refused to answer. Axanar PR manager Mike Borden requested that I split the interview into two podcasts so that he may defend Alec's comments. G'day everyone and welcome to the Trek Zone Spotlight. It's been a couple of months since CBS and Paramount filed joint legal action against today's guest, citing numerous breaches of intellectual property. Due to that case, I've been asked not to discuss the legal proceedings, but Mr Alec Peters joins me now via Skype. Alex, uh, Alec, thank you so much for your time. My pleasure, happy to be here. Now, Alec, there are uh, several topics I want to cover. Uh, first though, for those unaware, what is uh, Axana? Um, Axanar is a Star Trek fan film uh, that first started almost, well, I guess, just about two years ago. Uh, when we, on this day, two years ago, we had just finished our Kickstarter campaign for Prelude to Axanar, which is our 20 minute short film, which is available uh, on, uh, on YouTube. Uh, anyone can see it for free. Just go to YouTube, look up, look up uh, Star Trek Axanar, and you'll see Prelude to Axanar. And it is a. Um, Basically, Prelude to Axanar was made as kind of proof of concept to show what we could do um, so we could raise money to make a feature film uh, length Star Trek uh, project. So um, we uh, raised $101,000 to, uh, to make Prelude. Uh, it wound up costing us all told close to $130,000 uh, or so. Thousand dollars. Um, and uh, it's won over 47 film festival awards around the world. And I think it's uh, generally considered one of the you know best Star Trek fan films ever. And uh, uh, it 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 uh, the thing that was unique about it was it was almost almost entirely professionals uh, working on it. Um, and uh, that was you know I think what one of the things that made it really uh, really exceptional. In the beginning, uh, when the prelude uh, was being scripted, were there any concerns about the the legal grey area that fan films sit in? No, because um, we did nothing that every other fan film hasn't done, which is um, uh, place ourselves in, in uh, you know, in this fictional universe. And um, we, we, what we did was we, we made sure we, we tried to be as respectful as possible. I mean, you know, you have Star Trek fan films out there like Star Trek New Voyages, which has been around for 12, 13 years, or, or Star Trek Continues, that, who replicate the original Star Trek in grave, like great painstaking detail, mm. uh, everything is identical to the original series. We were the farthest thing from that. I mean, we don't even call ourselves Star Trek, um, you know, and we don't use Kirk, Spock, and McCoy, and and so, um, you know, knowing the, you know, I, there's some, although CBS, I have to be very specific about this. CBS has not told fan films what they can and cannot do. That, that is very specific. I know recently you had Rod Roddenberry on uh, and he mentioned guidelines and rules. Um, there are no rules. There are no guidelines. Um, and I know because I have worked with CBS probably more than anyone else from any other Star Trek fan film. I was an official licensee in 2010. I volunteered my time to work on the Star Trek uh, ar archive. Um, we sold all the props and costumes and set pieces from Star Trek The Experience at my company PropWorks. So I've worked with the head of CBS licensing, the head of CBS consumer products, the head of Star Trek licensing. Uh, the head of uh, CBS Home Video was a guest at the premiere of Prelude Tax Star in San Diego in 2014. So no one has, as, has, has dealt with them as much as I have. And we met with them last summer. I, I basically called up Liz Kalodner, the head of CBS licensing. I, I sent her an email, excuse me, and said, hey, Liz, why don't we get together and talk about this? And she was like, yeah, sure. Why don't you meet with John Van Sitters and Bill Burke? In Las Vegas at the con, we did, and they were very specific. We will not tell you what you can do. We will not tell you what you can do. We will let you know if you stepped over the line. 
And they also told us that only one other Star Trek fan film had ever gotten a cease and desist. Um, so they were very specific. They didn't want to do anything that would jeopardize their IP. Uh, How do you respond to, there are reports online though that uh, many, uh, almost all of the fan films have received uh, an, an email from CBS saying uh, this is what you can do and, and when you're doing... It's total fabrication. That is absolutely, we know the source of that, that is absolutely false. Um, we know because we have talked, you know, I've talked to the highest levels and they've said we will not do that. Um, so, uh, a matter of fact, recently um, a former... Uh, a, a former member of the Star Trek New Voyages crew claimed this online, um, and when confronted, will prove it. Show us what you know what what the rules are. She couldn't produce anything, and um, I, I think e e even even our detractors admit that she was way out of line. Um, there are simply no rules. Anyone who says otherwise, I is frankly lying. I mean, show me the piece of paper that says these are the guidelines. CBS has said specifically they will not give you guidelines. They will not tell you what they can do, you can do. They will not tell you what you cannot do because they do not want to do anything that jeopardizes their IP and may create rights, um, which is too bad because Lucasfilm does exactly that for Star Wars. Uh, Lucasfilm will tell you, here are the guidelines for making a Star Wars fan film. They publish them, and then they have a Star Wars fan film festival. Uh, you know, J.J. Abrams recently did a, a little uh, 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 a little commercial for the Fan Film Festival. So we really would love it if CBS did just that. I mean, the the, the landscape has changed so much with crowdfunding and and the technology these days that we would love nothing better than for CBS to come out with a set of guidelines and say, okay, here are the guidelines. You know, here's what you can do. Here's what you can't do. And sign this piece of paper to acknowledge that you've done it. Um, they've done nothing of the sort up until now. I'm going to circle back to crowdfunding and, and all those sort of things, but I do, I do want to just uh, touch back to Prelude and, and say that the mockumentary style of that uh, short was unique and, and an interesting way to convey the story. I really did enjoy it, as did many thousands of others. How did you come up with that idea? Well, we were trying to, you know, Star Trek Renegades had raised three hundred seventy-eight thousand um, dollars, and they did it on the back of a little, a little uh, teaser they did with Walter Koenig as as Chekhov and Tim Russ as, as Tuvok, and it was uh, it was really brilliant. And um, we said, "Wow, we need to do something like that in order to raise three hundred fifty thousand dollars or so that we originally thought we could make Prelude, uh, make Axonar for," um, and. So we needed a way to do that without building sets. Um, so I, I was racking my brain about how we were going to do this. And um, I remember this episode of MASH called The Interview uh, that won an Emmy Award for its screenplay. And it, it was basically um, done as a black and white newsreel at the time in the 50s where a newsreel reporter came in and interviewed the entire cast of MASH in character. And it was real personal behind the scenes stuff. And it was really powerful. And I pitched that to our then director, and he loved the idea. And I wrote the script. And um, yeah, it's it's since become you know a really, uh, you know, we, you look at something like uh, Band of Brothers, which had all those great interviews, or you know, Saving Private Ryan, or one of the films uh, that we you know used as a guide was Fighting Ali, which is all about the people who fought Muhammad Ali talking about their experiences and. You know, that whole kind of documentary style, we just felt no one had done it before. We thought it was something very different for Star Trek. Um, and we thought we could do it. And we did, do you know, do it relatively inexpensively. I mean, probably spent more than any other fan film episode had done. Um, but uh, it came out, uh, I think, judging by the fact that we have 2 million views on YouTube, uh, I think it came out pretty, pretty well. Well, there we are. That is Alec Peters on Trekzone from many, many years ago. He could have made the film by now, but alas, he's been sitting in a warehouse with a bridge set he couldn't even see how to use until his sycophant PR man showed him how it was done in his own fan film. That's on the record. Um, you can search for Axonar coverage here on Trekzone. I'm pretty sure there's a playlist of all the podcasts we've done with all the cast and crew that have left him and realised the truth uh, over the years. Still no Axonar. It is what it is, unfortunately, and people will eventually see the light. Well, for Trekzone, I'm Matt Miller. Thanks for watching. 
Keep up to date with Twitter. Catch new podcasts daily on YouTube. Plus, we're beaming to your favourite podcast app five days a week. Just search for Trekzone and subscribe.